troops kept security tight at the Siganella military base. From orders of the captain, he wanted the base closed off. In all, 19 people were reportedly aboard the plane when it was forced down in Sicily. They included five Egyptian diplomats and two officials of a PLO group. For all the advanced practice on paper, for all the know-how on the spot, it took high-tech and low-down seat-of-the-pants gumption to pick out the plane, force it down, and not have to fire a shot. Official Washington reflected the mood of the country over the success of the operation, outright elation. So this morning, the American giant stretched out its little finger and exacted a fitting bit of retribution. Many terrorism specialists believe this mission to Sicily may well spark acts of retaliation against Americans. But at the White House today, there was no second guessing. Said one top official, this is a time of renewal and strengthening for all of us. We had finally gotten it right. We had even the score. My president came through, and I'm proud and I show it. You could hear the New York accent in the Daily News headline, we bag the bums. You could not hear many dissenting voices in Manhattan today. In Times Square, the sentiment was, it's about time. It's about time that we did something about it. I really hope these guys get what's coming to them. We had plucked him out of the sky and dropped him in Sicily. It was an offer they could not refuse. And took some type of action. Here we are taking a little initiative and sticking it back to them. And the talk you heard in the bars of America today was tough talk. I think we should get him over here. Every one they kill of ours, kill two of theirs. That's this eye of an eye and tooth for a tooth. That line was written in the Middle East. And before they opened two I think that the role of the media in this country, as far as the Middle East is concerned, is one of propagating ignorance. The problem is here. You have people who know nothing doing the editing, doing the selection, in a sense, uh, determining what are the stories and sending to the journalists out there requests, we want you to follow this, we want you to follow that. Now, obviously, there is freedom of the press. That is to say, the journalist, to some extent, writes what he wants. But there are limits to that. And the limits are very constraining in many cases. Rashid Khalidi is associate professor of Middle East politics at Columbia University. He taught at the American University in Beirut during the 1970s and early 80s. He is also the author of a new book about the 1982 Israeli invasion of Lebanon. What do you see as the sort of the, the key elements that... Well, there is ignorance. There's a lot of lack of knowledge. Uh, and there's also, as far as what people generally know, there's the impact of very negative stereotyping in the media and the whole of the culture. Uh, of the Arab, and that also rubs off. And then there's the incredibly hyped up focus on terrorism, which has worked, I think, very successfully as a propaganda tool in the hands of the Israelis and their friends in this country. Uh, so all three of those things, I think, operate. Ignorance, very powerful cultural stereotyping, and the way in which the issue of terrorism has been manipulated. How has it been manipulated? Well, this is something that, uh, that as far as the Israelis are concerned, I think represents one of the great successes. If you look at, if you compare with South Africa, where uh, in some cases there are similar issues, you find that the South Africans have been very unsuccessful in posing the whole issue of empowerment, the whole issue of who controls a people's destiny, in terms of the narrow issue of terrorism. Now, terrorism is employed by the blacks in South Africa. There are bombings, there are killings of civilians, there are riots, there are a variety of extremely violent, very indiscriminate ways in which the blacks are fighting over the issue of empowerment and self-determination. By and large, the South African government has failed utterly, with Western public opinion, to put that issue in terms of the very narrow question of what means do these people use to fight oppression. In South Africa, everybody thinks of apartheid and oppression, everybody thinks of resistance, and everybody thinks of the issues of self-determination and empowerment as the only things that count. Senator Edward Kennedy toured South Africa this month at the invitation of Nobel Peace Laureate Bishop Desmond Tutu. They wanted to be as a family, husband with their wife. Kennedy came away dismayed at the continuing massive repression of black South Africans. They have to uh, dismantle uh, those laws uh, which make people second-class citizens in their own countries. The example, the forced relocation of citizens, uprooting them from land which they've held for generations and relocating them, uh, the, uh, denying them an opportunity to live with their families where they work, 
solely on the basis of race. Now, if we take, if we move to a somewhat different situation, not of the Palestinians, we're talking about empowerment. We have two and a half million people uh, living in Palestine, Palestinians, and we have three and a half million Jews, Israeli Jews. The Israeli Jews are all full citizens of the state of Israel. Of the Palestinians, less than three quarters of a million are citizens of the state of Israel, i.e., citizens of a Jewish state, which to some, just by the very definition of the state, they don't fit that main group. The other million and a half, or more than a million and a half, Palestinians have been living without any rights in a state of limbo under military occupation for, since 1967. Okay? The other two million Palestinians have been living in an exile, in exile from their homeland in the Palestinian diaspora. Prima facie, this is an issue of empowerment and self-determination. These are people who proclaim themselves to be a people, want to return to their homeland, and want to reconstitute themselves as a state or constitute themselves for the first time as a state. Uh, and they claim alongside Israel. There's an issue of, re of oppression, repression, uh, in the occupied territories at the very least. And there's an issue of resistance and then the issue of the means used to resist. Now, the means in many cases are horrible. Uh, and in some cases, I think, have nothing to do with the cause at hand. I mean, it's very difficult for me to see what the justification for uh, an attack at an airport in Europe is as far as uh, empowerment and so on. So it's true, in the, in the Palestinian case, you have a lot of red herrings. But th what the Israelis have succeeded in doing and what their, the, their clack of supporters in this country have, have amplified on is to put the whole thing, self-determination, empowerment, the original oppression, the original occupation, the original expulsion, into a little tiny box, which is the means used by the people who are fighting over these issues to resist occupation, oppression, deprivation of national rights, and so on and so forth. In Europe, it is more or less accepted, and has been for over a decade, that the Palestinians are favor a two-state solution. Uh, Europeans would like the Palestinians to be more forthcoming, but they would also like the Israelis to be more, forth more forthcoming. And uh, I don't like to use the word, but to a certain extent, there's an even-handed position, not just governmentally, but in terms of public opinion. That is to say, people recognize when a PLO statement is made, people listen to it, hear it, take it seriously, it's reported. In this country, by and large, those things are not reported, and they are not taken seriously, and the general trend is one of intense skepticism. Now, to what extent is this the fault of the Palestinians, and to what extent is this uh, the fault of the situation in this country? I would say partly it is the fault of the Palestinians. I don't think that I don't think that they have fully made explicit the extent to which they're willing to go in terms of things like mutual recognition, in terms of a two-state solution. Uh, that is certainly policy and has been for, well, probably since 73, 74. Uh, Ninety-five percent of, not experts, but of knowledgeable people in this country don't know that, whereas I would say probably that proportion in Europe does. Um, but I would say that a large part of the reason for this also rests on public opinion here. To a certain extent, people don't want to hear about it. These things mean Palestinian self-determination. These things mean Palestinian statehood. These things mean direct negotiations between Israel and the chosen representatives of the Palestinians. And when I say chosen, I mean chosen by the Palestinians, not by their enemies. These things mean inevitably and necessarily Israel, Israeli withdrawal from most, if not all, of the occupied territories. These things mean a serious confrontation within Israel between the extremist nationalists who desire to keep all of Palestine, i.e. Israel, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, as well possibly as other chunks of Arab territory occupied or not yet occupied, and between the accommodationists. Now, in face of having to accept all of these rather indigestible things, the easiest thing for people to do is hide their heads in the sand and say, no such choice is necessary. In fact, the preconditions are not here for us to even make that choice or face that choice. The Palestinians have not been forthcoming enough. It's not just in the Middle East that any nonsense peddled by the spokesman in the State Department or any garbage peddled by the president's spokesman is going to determine, to a very large extent, coverage. It is in Central America. It is in almost anything. Whereas with domestic policy, the journalistic establishment of the media establishment is very critical. On foreign policy, they tend to defer to power. And so what you had here was more, I think, than a case of bias in favor of Israel. It was a tendency to accept the Habib and, and State Department and White House definition of the issue, which was not people fighting for a cause and being forced out, but was rather uh, uh, the need to solve the problem by removal of the offending organism, which was the PLO. That's the way Habib saw it. It's a technical problem.
which will be resolved as soon as the PLO is removed. It was not an Israeli invasion. It was a PLO problem in Lebanon, which had to be solved. And the Israelis were, if anything, acting according to Habib and the American view of things in a positive way. So here it was not a bias in favor of Israel. Here it was the classic American media bias in favor of power. What was news for Americans uh, seemed like an old and often told story to the Palestinians. Only the most recent in a series of exoduses which started with the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 when some 800,000 Palestinians were dispersed to the West Bank, Gaza, and the neighboring Arab countries. In 1967, war broke out again. Another wave of refugees crossed the Jordan. How would you feel yourself being a refugee twice in your life? In 20 years? Not good. That's how I'm feeling. We are losing confidence in anything in the world now, even the conscience of the world, because this world there is no justice, but there are interests only, and where interest goes, justice disappears. In 1964, Egypt founded the PLO, essentially as a means of, of cutting off or, or preempting an independent Palestinian nationalism for developing. They figured that they would create a tame, uh, a Palestinian entity or Palestinian representative as a means of preventing an independent one from developing. This failed. Ultimately, five years later, the, 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 the independent Palestinian movements took over the PLO and, in a, in a sense, took it away from Egypt and from the Arab League. Uh, the Palestinians then got into a, 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 a clash with Jordan. Uh, the growth of independent Palestinian power in Jordan was perceived as a threat to the to the independence of the of the of the well, to the, was perceived as a threat to the monarchy, and uh, that resulted in September 1970 in uh, the suppression of the Palestinian resistance movement in Jordan by the Jordanian regime. Uh, thereafter, the PLO moved its focus and center of operations to Lebanon. A clash with Lebanon erupted, uh, with, or with many Lebanese erupted in 1975-76, and the PLO ha hung on in Lebanon until the Israeli invasion of 1982. After the war, the hazy figure of the fleeing refugee was quickly replaced with the menacing bogeyman of the 80s. Now, the message had become clear. The victims are people like us. The attackers are people like them. Why a history of the PLO? Well, it's not so much a history of the PLO. It's, a, it's, a, it's an analysis of what the PLO did and why during the war. And why was I interested in writing this? Because I don't think that's a story people know very much about. I don't think people know very much at all about the PLO, for that matter. And I felt on reading the material that was published about the war that while other aspects of it were fairly well covered, the Israeli side, for example, uh, the American side, uh, to some extent, even the Lebanese side. Uh, that was not the case for the Palestinian side, and the Palestinians were one of the main protagonists. The other problem is that, to some extent, Palestinian history has been appropriated by other people, uh, sometimes with ill intention and sometimes with you know, no in ill intention at all. 
part of the problem of the Palestinians it, is that, to a very large extent, their opponents deny their very existence. There's a notorious, very well uh, uh, reviewed and very widely distributed book, which in effect, from time immemorial, which in effect denies the very existence of the Palestinians. It's basically a piece of trash. It has no scholarly foundation, whatever. The point is that important, powerful, respected intellectuals gave this book uh, uh, very, very high praise, and it's sold in the hundreds of thousands of copies, and this is popular wisdom. They censor everything which is against the occupation, and I think this is not uh, fair. Uh, also, everything which uh, which is about uh, confiscating of land, about uh, jailing people, arresting people, uh, about confiscating uh, books or uh, written material, about uh, banning uh, uh, art uh, activities, uh, all these things which has to do with the Palestinian national identity or with the human side of the Palestinian people, it is censored. An overwhelming dependence on American aid to finance its activities keeps Israel heavily preoccupied with maintaining a favorable public image in the United States, an image it finds increasingly difficult to reconcile with the brutal realities of its military occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Okay. They took our land. That's, the, that's land. It's our land. They took it. And uh, we can't live here if there is no land. Our land. We live from it, our food, our everything. We live here for our land. If there is no land, why we live here? If they do not give us our land, or, or if they want to take our land, we can't live here. By now, they don't even give a reason. They just confiscate land. And lately, uh, that's what happened more and more. They are pushing the villagers, the Palestinians, into their villages. So how can you keep people inside a small village without spreading? And that's what exactly they're doing. When did you move in? We moved in three days ago. Yeah. How come you picked this place? What, Everett? Right? Yeah. Well, first of all, um, we think that strategically it's very important for the country. And we believe it's a uh, definite part of Eretz Israel, of the land of Israel, and that uh, that they, we should populate this area. إحنا طالبين السلام إحنا أهل الدفع الغربية كلنا يعني بدنا نستقر في أرضنا بدنا نسلم في أرضنا بدنا نعيش في أرضنا. Two things that are hard for people to understand in light of this overemphasis on, or this almost exclusive emphasis on uh, terrorism, quote unquote, uh, are the fact that the Palestinians are a large polity or body politic with a pretty complicated, as in any body politic, pretty complicated political. Uh, structures. And secondly, that the PLO and other Palestinian entities have all kinds of para-governmental, para-state, uh, social and educational and other uh, uh, aspects to them. So the fact that the Palestinians have a parliament, and that they meet, that they debate, that there's a press, that they argue among one another, that they have a, a, a fairly democratic decision-making system, all of these things are not very well known. Uh, nor is the fact that the PLO has a hospital system, uh, that uh, there's a social welfare system, that there are factories, uh, that there are uh, 
a number of things, educational, in, a large network of educational institutions, uh, which people just don't think of when they think of the PLO. That, that, in fact, is the case. A lot of this, by the way, has been disrupted by the Lebanese invasion. And that's one of the things I would argue that the Israeli government at the time was intent on doing, not just dealing with the PLO as a military threat, which it really wasn't. In fact, I don't think that had anything to do with anything. There was no real military threat. That's not the reason that Israel invaded Lebanon, but rather to deal with the political challenge of the PLO, of, of the, this polity which was getting itself more and more organized, and with the sort of Paris state structural institutional challenge of the PLO. Although Israel succeeded in its efforts to destroy the PLO infrastructure in Lebanon, peace seems no closer than it did four years ago. Is there any moral or political or and political lessons that both sides, the Palestinian and Israel, had or could draw from this, I would say, pointless war? Well, I mean, one of the lessons is a lesson for the Israelis, which is that you can't solve the Palestine question by force. Essentially, that is the way Sharon wants to solve it, and that is the way many Israeli leaders have tried to solve it, and, or, or, or many of them, I think, even now would like to solve it that way. Uh, to my way of thinking, that should have been the main lesson of the war. As far as the Palestinians are concerned, there are, I would say, other lessons. Um, one of them is to put into even sharper relief the strategy followed by the PLO leadership before the war. And by strategy, I'm not simply talking about quote-unquote armed struggle. I'm talking about how the Palestinians intend to get from where they are to where they want to be, how they intend to get from their current situation to, to be, uh, well, as far as we can tell from the Palestine National Congress meetings and the resolutions over 12 or so years, they want to be in an independent Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza uh, alongside Israel. That's where they want to be. How do they get there is what I'm arguing uh, is not really clear. And the strategy for doing that before the war was essentially a diplomatic and propaganda strategy based on having a military base in Lebanon, in effect, which was strong enough to defend the PLO while it went about this diplomatic and political and propaganda uh, offensive. That failed because the Israelis clearly saw that they could knock the base out from under the feet of the people who were carrying out this relatively successful uh, diplomatic campaign. Uh, the point is, A, that it, the base was vulnerable, and B, that it was only relatively successful. In the last analysis, Israel remained in occupation, continues transforming the face of Palestinian territories in the West Bank and Gaza. So the Palestinians are still, I would say, not much closer to achieving their objectives than they were, say, a decade ago. All these things uh, making the people under very horrible stress, this makes them trying to tell the world that come and see our miserable situation. We want to live as other people living. We can't write about this in newspapers. We can't say this uh, even to the journalists. The Palestinians are not simply abstract figures on the balance sheet of regional or global power. They are a people, deny the homeland, deny the name. Until the Western press seeks images which challenge stereotypes instead of reinforcing them, the chances of Americans understanding the complex realities of the Middle East are close to non-existent. Peace in the Middle East will be only an illusion unless the basic human rights of the Palestinians are acknowledged. war now by stones. That is only our believing, our bodies, and the stones. There is no way.
we have no other choice. And because of this, the, the, the Palestinian people will continue doing this. Even if, if the Israeli tanks surrounding and closing all the villages and the refugees camps and the main cities in the West Bank, people will continue in this way until they have their own rights to have their own state. Sharma! 